Hey guys, welcome to the Captain's Collective Podcast. My name is Hunter Levine, and each episode we sit down to gather wisdom, knowledge, and stories from fishing captains and other industry leaders. If you enjoy this podcast, we ask that you share it and help spread the word as we get this new project off the ground. In today's episode, we sit down with former guide and current skiff builder, Harry Spear, and hear about how he went from being a ponytail hitchhiking zoology student to a guide in the Florida Keys with over 30 years experience. Harry and I sat down in his home after an awesome dinner, and I was blown away by his story and the knowledge that he shared. I'm excited for you to get to hear this conversation. We hope that you enjoy. This is the Captain's Collective. Success is a gift. Excellence is the only thing to strive for. Uh, he, hit, he, right. tried to eat it. he tried to eat it. Hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him. He got him. He's on. Uh, two butt caps off the rods, filled them with tequila. We took a shot and out we went. There, there ain't no getting into it after that. It's you're, you're hooked. It's a bad habit. And all the time, flips the. He's standing there ready to go for a tarpon. Any time, I said, "You talk so much, you're like a senator." Harry, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. It means a lot that you would sit down with me. I've been following your work for a few years now, and it's uh, just a privilege to get to sit down here and talk with you a little bit more about boats and fishing and guiding. Could you just start with just telling us a little bit about your background and your story? Well, I grew up in Tampa, and I loved fishing ever since I can remember, and I was good at it, so it kind of gave me an identity and after high school, I went to college at the University of South Florida and studied zoology. And I thought I wanted to be this jazz guitarist, and I was totally inadequate. And I decided that that wasn't going to work for me. And my friend Dale Perez was in the Florida Keys guiding. And I drove down there. Actually, I hitchhiked down there with my guitar, and my long hair, and my no money. And I got a job as a mate on a charter boat, and it was just like I thought that I'd died and gone to heaven when I moved down there in the early 70s. So that's kind of where I got my start. And so transitioning from, okay, I'm gonna, I want to be this musician to working on a boat, and you had that conversation with Dale. I mean, where did that conversation come from? Did you just reach out to him and say, hey... Is there something available for me? or I don't really remember how it happened. I think my mother or my dad or somebody told me that Dale was down in the Keys when I'd, I'd hitchhiked back from upstate New York to Florida. And uh, I went down. I, I don't even remember exactly how that all played out. Uh, but I moved down there, and I got a job the second day. I got a haircut the first day. No, I got a haircut the second day after I got my job because this guy was a redneck and he scared me. So I got a haircut, cut all my long hair off, and uh, and then never looked back. Wow. And so you start off, you get that job, and then eventually you work your way into guiding. What did that transition look like for you? How did you get uh, that It was start? a slow transition. I'm, I mean, I didn't have any money, so... I had to make enough money to buy a boat and a truck and all of those things. So it took me a couple of years and I did quite a bit of fishing, flats fishing. I knew right away that I didn't want to work offshore. Boats break. They're a total pain in the butt. It's big boats. All you do is work on your boat. And uh, I love the, the sight fishing aspect of guiding and the fact that you could do it one person could do everything as far as a business aspect of it. And so that's what my goal was right from the get-go. And this is back in the 70s. Early 70s. Early yeah. 70s. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, could you kind of just help me get a picture for what that time looked like down in the Keys in the early 70s with this flats fishing? You really don't want to know. It was, um, it was literally like, I died and gone to heaven. There was almost nobody 
in the Florida Keys. There were, you know, people, but as far as people fishing on the flats from Miami to Key West, there might have been 30 people with skiffs. Wow. Period. The environment was open. It was pristine. There was motor scars already, you know, from people running around in, in different areas. But the grasses were long and dark. There were no diatoms on the grass. There was a lot of fish, even though the guides who'd been there 20 years before said it was already over. It was pretty magnificent. You could go out and see hundreds, if not thousands, of fish some days. And... There was a lot of bonefish, a lot of permit, a lot of tarpon. What's pretty interesting, when I started guiding, the older anglers that had been fishing for a while, you could hardly get them to fish for tarpon. They got, ah, those damn things are too stupid. Why would I want to fish for them? And they were. <laughs> they were so easy to feed. You could throw out any chunk of chicken on a, on a hook, on a fly rod, and drag it in front of them and... Most of the time, they just wolf it down. But for a young guy, there's never been anything like a tarpon. To me, they're the most perfect fish that was ever invented for a fly rod. They're big. They'll eat right on the surface. They're visual. They jump. They fight like crazy. They make all kinds of noise when they fly through the air. Just magnificent. Loved them. Always loved them. How, how long did you guide down in the Keys? 30 years. Wow, 30 years. 30 years nonstop. And, uh, and then when I moved up here to North Florida, I went back and guided for a while. But this is a kind of sad thing. I, I dreaded when I'd have to go back to the Keys. It was like I did not want to go back. Just was, the change that was I, there? Or? I really don't know. It, it's, uh, I don't know whether it's spiritual, psychological, emotional. It's probably a combination of all of them. I just wanted to not be there anymore. I, I left because of the tremendous influx of people in the environment down there. It was really frustrating. It's hard to do what you love to do, to really guide. And to really guide to me is to be able to say to yourself, I'm here, I want to go there. And to be able to go there because you felt like there was going to be fishing over there. Towards the end, you just kind of have to, you'd find a place with fish on it and just beat them to death. Because if you went someplace else, there was already other people there. So it's frustrating. I didn't want to grow old there. I just didn't want to grow old there. And I wanted my kids to grow up in what I thought America was. Mm. And I kind of thought that this was a pretty cool place. Moving was, up to the panhandle. Just packed up and moved. and Yeah, it's, it's pretty complicated, but it's kind of like that. My oldest daughter was struggling a little bit. You know, she was getting a little wild. Um, not obscenely wild, but I was noticing a change in her. And I just didn't want to fight the partyville of the Florida Keys for her. And when you look at how the fishing industry, not just the Florida Keys, but just the fishing industry in general, the boats, the different rigs, the, I mean, as so much change has come. I mean, what are some of your thoughts when you think about, you know, some of the good old days, but also some of the positive things that are coming around that are new? That That's a tough one for me. Um I when I started, there was charts. We used to pull up stakes when people put stakes to, you know, to mark places. We tried to keep everything quiet and uh, private. And today, with all the uh, technological advances, you can never be on the water in your whole life and you can go fish anywhere I've ever fished. There's charts and plotters and GPSs that show you with new, there's new, I know there's new cards out now that show you fishing spots basically everywhere. So it's, um, it's too easy. 
I, I don't like it. It removes some of the adventure kind of behind discovering new places. and I think it removes all of it. Um, it's still a beautiful thing to be on the flats and go fishing or, or to be anywhere and go fishing. But if you think of the history of what went on in the Florida Keys, South Florida, wreck fishing, figuring stuff out in general, the, the thousands and thousands of man hours that people put in to figure things out. And today people can just go plug in and go there. No, I think it's cheap. When you think about your time in the Keys and your time as a guide, what are some of your favorite memories? I've got a lot of favorite memories. Um, my dad went in the All Tackle Bonefish Tournament with me when I was when he was seventy five years old. Couldn't stand up in the boat. Um, that was one of the most special things that's ever happened to me in my life. Uh, being able to do something with my dad like that, and n thinking that it was going to be just a an event where he could go participate and. And we led from the first day all the way through the last day. It was a great, it was a gr that was a great event. Watching my kids um, grow up in the Florida Keys and catching all those fish that they caught with me and, and being able to turn them on to such a beautiful environment and watch them grow in that. Um, I can see so many pictures of, fishermen and fish and all of that stuff. But I mean, if you boil it down to your family and, and what you do and what you love, I'm that's, that'd be probably my most favorite things. Just that time out there with your dad, 70 years old. What were you guys? 75, targeting? 75. Mm -hmm. What were you guys targeting? Do you remember? You it guys... was bonefish. It was a bonefish tournament. It was the all tackle bonefish tournament. And my dad fished with live bait. We never tried anything else. And, uh, he just did it. He did good. He did really good. And we were fortunate. We caught more and bigger than anybody else did. And we won. And it was just, I got, I got a picture of my father and I when we were pulling into the uh, fishing club in Isla Morado. We were pulling in and Hank Brown was pulling out in his boat. He was driving out and he asked my dad, he goes, John, how many did you catch today? And my dad held up. One hand full of fingers and another finger. He caught six bonefish the last day, and, and Hank said, you won. I grabbed my dad by his face and kissed him on the mouth, and you, I couldn't have smiled harder. My lips were past my ears, and my dad was the same way. We were just so ecstatic. It was like, you know, you wouldn't even dream you could do something like that. What a great memory. And to think about just that tournament, that's the thing that stood out was that time that you got with him. Yeah. He told me later, it's one of the greatest things, gifts that anybody's ever given to me. He said that was the greatest experience he'd ever had as an adult. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And 75 yeah. years old and yeah. you're fishing tournaments. And I want to ask you a little bit about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But most people when they're fishing tournaments, their first thought might not be, let's get the 75-year-old dad on the boat. But to you, it was about more than just winning, although y'all did win. Well, it was, there's a lot of co combination from a, to fish my father in that tournament. My angler was unable to show up. And uh, I went to the tournament director and all the fishing guides. You're not supposed to fish relatives in those tournaments because people could cheat. And uh, so I had to lobby everybody. And they all said, yeah, fish your dad. I said, we have no chance of winning. My dad can't even stand up in the boat. He literally couldn't. I'd have to walk him. He was so wobbly. Put him on a cooler on the bow of the boat. No, no casting platforms back then. I just put a cooler up there. And he'd sit on that. And uh, so we lobbied everybody. And they said, yeah, sure. And then my dad really surprised me. He had a... He was a good golfer, and he had really good hand-eye coordination, and he couldn't see the fish hardly at all. But he was able, 
with my instruction to point the rod in the right direction, and then we'd use a short, medium, or long cast was the directions. And I can't tell you how many times I'd look at where I wanted the bait to land, and the bait would land right there. So it was pretty easy, honestly, from a, a technical standpoint. But from a psychological standpoint, it was like, there's no way this is ever going to happen. But it did. <laughs> so it was, it was amazing, wonderful, and really gratifying and a, a memory that I'll treasure for the rest of my life. I bet that first moment when he threw that bait out and y'all were on, I bet that was a, a big moment right there. Actually, the first fish he hooked either broke off or fell off, and it was a big fish, <laughs> and it was like I was throwing up on the inside. Did you think this is going to be the day? Like, this is going to be all day long like this? or mm, No, I don't know. You know, it's just, in, as in any sport, you've played sports. You go out in the beginning of the game, you fumble the ball or you do whatever, and you go, God. You know, it's just like, ugh, that's not the way you want to start. But we started that way, but he pulled through. You know, he, he fished well. He just fished well the whole tournament. And we were able to catch a bunch of big fish and a bunch of little ones. And when all the points were added up at the end, we had more than the next person. It was a five-day tournament, and uh, it was really exciting, really cool. What attracted you to tournament fishing as a guide? Um, competing. Proving yourself. You know, I mean, what is it in sports? You know, you don't go out there to play sports to lose. You know, you want to win. And uh, I can remember this is, um, as I look back, it was really uh, integral to me being, having confidence enough to win. My best friend when I was early on guiding was Steve Huff, who's the greatest flats fisherman that's ever been, ever will be. There'll never be another one like him. But I'd fished three or four ter different tournaments, and I'd done okay, but it just something would, things would happen, you know, and I just never got right up at the top. It was like I'd be always back, not in the middle, but not in the front. And Steve said, hey, don't worry about it. You're going to want a pile of these things. And I said, do you really think so? He goes, no, I know so. So that kind of, that would sit in the back of my mind. I'm going to be able to do this. And when I won the first tournament that I won, it was with Bill Boone. It was a fly fishing bonefish tournament. I was just like, I've never been so excited. And then I won another one. And then I just, started winning tournaments and it was like really wasn't that hard to do once you knew what to do and but breaking over the edge I think that probably for any athlete between being competing and winning and then believing you can win it's a, it's a big hurdle once you cross that hurdle it's not like will I win it's how much am I going to win by you know, so I'm going to win. <laughs> That's kind of the way I looked at it. I, it wasn't about winning so much as I hated to lose towards the end, which is a kind of a sick way of competing. But that's kind of the way that end of my tournament career was. I just didn't want to lose. But by the end, you had won 47. Three. 43. 43. A pile. That's a lot. And towards mm -hmm. the end, kind of what was different in your mind at 43 than at one i didn't at first i would literally go into a tournament and i would just be so excited i'd i'd have literally i'd have diarrhea the first morning of the tournament i i couldn't go out on the boat i'd be just so excited i'd have to go to the bathroom. that is a visual <laughs> that is a bad visual yeah. but it's true at the end of my career it was just like I'm not going to lose. Mm. It wasn't, I didn't care about winning. I just did not want to lose, which is a good way to segue out of tournament fishing, which my friend Steve Huff and I had lunch one day and we were sitting there and we we're talking about 
tournament fishing and whatnot. And he said, we don't have anything else to prove. And I go, yeah, that's true. We won everything. We, we spent 10 years competing against each other, a 10-year segment where we finished first and second in every tournament we competed against each other in, which is, I don't know of too many different kind of sports where two guys or two teams have done that. <laughs> and, uh, and Steve said, he kind of um, started the conversation. He said, we don't have anything else to prove. Um, why don't we quit doing this? And I said, if you'll quit, I'll quit. He goes, I'll quit. And I go, I'll quit. And I, I can remember my friend saying, oh, you'll be back. You'll keep doing that. And I'd say, well, you don't know me very well. I've decided I'm done. It was the same when I quit guiding. I said, I'm done. And I quit. I, the last two tournaments I fished in, I finished first and second. And it was unfortunate I didn't fish second and first. I would have liked to have won the last tournament, but I fished second. <laughs> but yeah. I was still not too bad. It would have been great to go, go out on first, but 43 first. is not bad. I think you can. 43 wins in uh, is something as competitive as that. Is, um, yeah, I'm, I was really blessed. And you overcame your, your diarrhea issues from the beginning. So um, It took me a while, for a few <laughs> years, <laughs> but I did overcome it. I, thinking about when you really first began guiding and you first began in these tournaments, if you could go back and tell yourself one thing, give yourself a sit down, what would you go back and say? Um, I don't know whether it would be about tournaments or fishing so much. I would have been... Um, searching for how to say this correctly and honestly. I would have been more faithful to my clients. I would have been a better friend. Um, I wouldn't have been so competitive. Winning wouldn't have been as important as it was to me. And I think that was born out of insecurity. You know, you, uh, you get an identity from winning, being the best, as opposed to having an identity from what's within you, in your heart. And I, I think I put too much emphasis on that and relationships that I had with clients suffered uh, as a result. I wasn't as good a friend as I could have been. If I could have changed anything, I would have been a better friend. I would have loved my clients more than I did. And uh, to segue out of that, my son Luke, he's got that. He's the people that fish with my son love my son. They liked fishing with me more because I was really good. And some of them really loved me. But my son Luke, he's got it. He's just so relational. And uh, so vicariously, I get to relive that. What I would have liked to have been, he is. And he's at 23. He's at 23 and guiding since he was 19. And he's got an amazing career ahead of him. He's so good already. And uh, he's just a great human being. It's so fun to be on the water with him. And you get that opportunity with, with all that experience and learning from mistakes and learning different things over all those years on the water to look back and to instill that in him. Is that the big thing that you drive home is to focus on the clients, to focus on the people? <sighs> no, I think the difference between Luke and myself is I, my faith really started just before I got married and we homeschooled all of our kids. We had a great group of homeschoolers that were all part of the same church that all loved the Lord, all loved each other, all loved our kids. And we just kind of lived it with our kids. And I don't, I think it's more, it's not like what I tried to put in to Luke or my children. I think it's more osmosis. You know, they, they see what 
love and family and friendship is all about, and they choose it. And that's Luke. He just chose it. You know, I didn't stuff it down him, that's for sure. And I, and I had talked to you about this earlier, but in your video that you have on your website, which I love, and the episode you did with Explore where you built the skiff, it's pretty easy to tell that faith and family are really important to you. How does that impact the way that you lead your business and live your life? Well, I, I wish I could say honestly that I was not hypocritical in any way. That would be a lie. <laughs> but uh, I, I definitely love the Lord, and my goal in life is to please Him. But I'm a very fallible man. And uh, so I don't look at myself. I definitely do not put myself on any pedestals. I, I feel like I'm slightly below the bottoms of the soles of my feet, <laughs> <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Um, but it is hugely important to me the fact that the God of the universe knew me, knows me, loves me, and wants me. And that I've been able to have all of these phenomenal blessings in life as a result of all of that. The way that he made me, that I was able to, f to find out, find the niche that he created me for and flow with it, and flow in it, and I, I'm still in it, and I'm, you know, nearing the end of my life at 68. Uh, I don't, you know, if I died tonight, I'd be totally happy. You know, it's been a great, great run. I love my life. I don't want it to stop, but I'd be happy if it did. And to have four great kids that... um all successful in their own endeavors and have good lives and good mates and, and uh, are good human beings. God, who could ask for more than that? And I think it's really awesome to think about what we talked about a few moments ago, which is you're in the Keys. It's the glory days. It's beautiful. And from a fishing perspective, it's going great. But you made the decision... I don't feel like this is what's best for my family. And you move up here, and you can say that today. And I think that says a lot. It's, uh, I don't know whether that was um, folly or not. It was very difficult moving up here and reinventing yourself. I did, but it wasn't easy. And now, you know, building skiffs, I've got a nice little niche that, and I'm still involved in the same industry. And uh, people love my boats. And uh, I think the coolest thing that I did was another instance where I put myself out for the Lord. I first boat I built, I wrote this prayer in it, took a picture of it and put it on Facebook. And I just basically said when I did that, I went, all right, Lord. It's in your court. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> and uh, and now today I have people call me up and say, I love so much what you do, how you pray over every one of your skiffs, and I would never buy a boat from anybody else because of that. And sort of a kind of a... You stand for your, your principles, what you believe in, mm -hmm. and... Uh, if they're righteous principles, God will definitely uh, honor you for it. It's, it's cool. <laughs> you know, we think about tournament fishing and making a name, and I think social media in a lot of ways has put a lot of pressure to, to you know, be popular, to be liked, to have a lot of followers or make a lot of money, have the coolest boat. But when you think about success, what really comes to mind to you? Yeah, I love that question. I don't really care about success. Success is a gift. Excellence 
is the only thing to strive for in my book. To be the best that you can be, the best that God made you uh, at whatever you want to do. And it doesn't really matter what you're doing. It's just trying to be the best that you can at that. And success is a gift that other people give you as they acknowledge your desire and your striving for excellence. So um, success is a nice thing, but I don't measure my life by it. Mm. When you think about towards the end, end of your career and towards the um, latter part of your life, and then you look at your 23-year-old son and you look at other young guys in the industry, what are some things that you pray would be preserved and left behind for them? Ooh. Um, I just hope that what they see in their lifetimes, they can have a... feeling that it's awesome you know that they the environment that the whatever their endeavor is that they still get really excited about it because it's different it's where I had a few boats when I started that some days I probably had close to a hundred days guiding where I never saw a boat period on the water especially in the lower keys never saw anything not a commercial boat recreational boat fishing guide nothing so that is gone forever and ever and ever that's never going to happen but the fact that they can go out there and catch fish and and win in the way that they win you know, that they can go out there and feel like they've done something really cool. You know, they're never going to go out there and jump 50 tarpon in a day like I did on a fly rod and never not see tarpon all day long where there's just wads and wads of fish everywhere and you just go bounce one here, bounce one there, wind them in, let them go, hope they get off because there's so many and you just want to hook them. They're not going to see that, but they can go out there and catch some fish during the day and uh, when they might expect to catch zero or one and they go catch three or four and they've had a great day. And it is a great day, you know. Their expectations are different. But the fact that they can love it and enjoy it and experience it, that's what I'd wish for them. If I came in and told somebody I jumped 50 tarpon, they might send me to a medical facility today. Well, first of all, they would know at your age that you didn't. <laughs> You're definitely not old enough. <laughs> that, that was an experience that... Now, look, I got it for 30 years. How many days did I do that? Three, maybe, that I jumped over 40 fish in a day. But... I can see it. I can see it like it was right now. I can look just with my eyes wide open. I can see all those fish laying there, and I can watch it all happening. So I've got that treasure. It's mine. <laughs> I don't have to give it up. I can see all of that stuff. I can't see all of it, but there's so many memories that I have that it doesn't take much to trigger one to the next, to the next, to the next, as far as the stories and the episodes, the chapters that I've been fortunate enough to partake in my life. And the name of this podcast is Captain's Collective, and we really love capturing different stories and tips and knowledge from different captains. And earlier you mentioned Steve Huff, but when you think about a, a good captain or a great captain? I mean, what makes a great captain? Well, it's, it's definitely a communicating thing and it's a relational thing. You're, you're in a small boat, at least as a guide, skiff guide, you're in a small boat 
and and uh, you've got one or two clients with you and you're trying to show them a good day on the water so it's a relational thing they've got to have a good time regardless of whether they catch fish or not for them to be satisfied so it's definitely that part of it uh, a guide needs to be smart enough to figure out all the nuances of nature and I don't think there's a really any really good fishermen that aren't smart they might not be highly educated but they're smart to be able to figure out all the stuff that goes on. There's so many factors that you've got to juggle to be able to figure out what you want to do and to pull it off and make it happen. And it gets harder and harder as time goes on. Um, a great set of eyes for a flats guide is, I don't know how you could do it without being able to see well. Um, you've got to be able to work hard, a work ethic, You've got to be willing to hurt to be a good fishing guide, I think. I mean, Steve Huff said it so eloquently. He said the secret to being a good fishing guide, and this is back in the day, is 18 feet long, 18 feet long and it fits in your hands. He was talking about a push pole. Shoving yourself mile after mile after mile, figuring out what's there, and then being able to deal with it. And And one of those things is actually being able to position your boat and communicate with your angler to give them the best opportunity for whatever chances you have during their day, whatever the, um, the opportunities are. It's real easy to put yourself, put the angler in the wrong place where he can't, has to cast over the boat, and it's difficult for him to um, make a cast, and especially with a fly rod, you know. I mean, you've positioning the boat is important the equipment you're using is important the flies you're using the technique where do you put the fly what do you do with it once you get it there to get the fish to respond to it need it and if you can train somebody or they are a good enough angler it gets to be uh, much more of a fun team sport because you all you have to do is say I got some at 10 o'clock, and he goes, I got them. And then you can shut up and watch. But that's not usually the case. Most of the time you're, you're trying to teach and, and help with communication, verbal communication, help your angler get, get the best out of the opportunities that you find during a day. I think that it's pretty close to what they need or what anybody needs to have to be a good fishing guide all those different pieces coming together and not ignoring any one section there. It's like a pie that's cut up into a lot of pieces. Some pieces are pretty big, but there's a lot of pieces are teeny little slivers that make ultimately the difference between in tournament fishing, especially it's never the big slices of pie that win the tournament. It's always the little ones. The, I took care of my, all of my terminal tackle. I made sure my angler got his foot out of the loop of the line when he was clearing the line so that he didn't break the fish off. It's the small things that you just have to... It's like being a great coach on a, a basketball team. I think a basketball because it's so quick. And... Uh, Fly fishing is a lot of it is really quick. It's you know, and then it's over. You know, it's just here and it's gone. And it's the same. The team's going down the court, and the running guard's in the wrong place, and the other guy's going to get by him, and the coach is screaming, and he's trying to get everybody to follow what's going on and get in the right place and not let the bad thing happen. <laughs> and that's kind of like what a fishing guy is. He's a he's Sometimes he's a player, but he's a coach. He's in the game because he's controlling the boat, but he's also trying to coach the team, which is the the guide and the angler. It's uh, 
it's a lot going on and really quick. You've got to have, you got to be succinct and, uh, and articulate in what you say, or it's just, you miss it. You can't go, I got one. He's over there. Where's over there? <laughs> There's 360 degrees over there. <laughs> So you, you, you can see what I mean. And I think about that story you told about your dad sitting on the front of the boat and he's on this cooler yeah. and you're calling the shots for him. Here they are, here they are, here they are. But being a guide, you get the opportunity to be with people during some of the most incredible moments in their life. Yeah, that, that is true. Um, one of the really cool gifts that I've had in my life is... I've had people tell me how much they loved their time fishing with me. And I remember this one guy, John Rucavina, said, the only thing that I regret in my life, he was in his 70s, he said that I didn't spend more of my money fishing with you and spending more time with you on the water. That's a pretty huge gift for somebody to say something like that, that they if they look back and they go, gosh, I just wish I'd have spent more time with you fishing because I had so much fun. That's pretty sweet. And, you know, just so, so much joy I can see coming from you when you're talking about your days as a guide. But what was it like for you to transition into making boats and making these skiffs? Um, I don't know. It was, um, I didn't want to guide anymore. And uh, I knew a lot about boats. I designed boats for other companies. I'd made my own one-off skiffs and I, uh, I was just crazy enough to think that I could reinvent myself and, and do that. And I've made some pretty, pretty cool skiffs since I started doing that. I'm, I'm very happy with the, the innovations that I've come up with. And 30 years of guiding and then just to venture into that i mean that's taking a big risk but yeah but i've always done that i'm that's probably one of my strongest attributes i've never been afraid to jump off the cliff and hope that i could fly before i hit the bottom and it must be really rewarding i think about fly fishing and tying your own fly and catching a fish on the fly and it's rewarding to see that happen but then i start thinking about man building your own skiff <laughs> And riding in the water in a boat that you designed. What are you thinking about when you're designing your own skiff and you have all that control? Um, that's a really good question. And I wish more people would think about that because it would really help the, uh, the design of... A skiff is nothing more... Everybody listen to this. This is important. <laughs> it's an interface with the water. Um, all the stuff above the water line is superfluous bull crap. It's just a place that you can put your gear and whatnot. What interfaces with the water is what makes a skiff do what it does. So, with that being said, that's what I think about, is the bottom of the boat, not the top of the boat. That is the secret to building a great boat. And you're thinking about how it rides, how it pulls. Yes. That's what I think about, the interface. That's the secret to building a great boat. What mistakes do a lot of people make when they start shopping for a boat and they get into a boat, or maybe even they start building their own boats? Um, I would say the biggest mistake people make is... They go for lipstick and clothing rather than the creature that's wearing it, metaphorically speaking. I think that anybody listening to this can figure that out. They look for something that's pretty and cool rather than something that's a tool because that's all it is. It's a tool. And a good tool does a job well. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It just does the job well. It works. And uh, I, th 
think that's the mistake that most people make. They get caught up in the glitz and the glamour of uh, marketing. Marketing is um, it's a vicious tool. It's, it's used to take your money and give it to me or to somebody else. It's not designed to give you the best product. Brain power gives you the best product. <laughs> You have to, you have to get out of the way of, am I going to be cool or am I going to have a good tool? So there you go. That's that answer. That's, that's incredibly helpful. And I think that you, what you said about getting caught up in the glitz and glamour, I think that applies well beyond boats. It applies to life in general. Modern life is about um, what can I sell you? What can I say to you to make you buy this thing that you don't need? <laughs> I mean, because if you really think about what you need, it's not that much stuff. So, and boats are, for most people, a definitely a not need. It's a want. There are some people that need them. If you make your living on the water, you need some kind of a boat. But, all the other people that's a want, I want it because I want to go fishing or I want to go skiing or whatever, or go to the sandbar and have cocktails with my friends, <laughs> whatever you like. <laughs> and along the way, so many are, it's almost like a treadmill and you're not even that satisfied, but you're just so busy chasing the dream and chasing the glitter that sometimes you miss, you know, what really matters. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, one of the things that I've done in my life is I've tried to pare everything down to the lowest common denominator. And uh, it's hard to do in today's world. There's so much input. There's so much stuff... I mean, you can't go buy anything without having a hundred choices. Sometimes thousands of choices. It's hard to figure out what's the right thing for what you want. I mean, I'm a, I love golf. I, there's no way that I could try out all the golf clubs that are made. And then when you think about customizing them, Stiffer shaft, higher launch, longer shaft, different heads. <laughs> you go crazy. Boats are the same thing. And when yep. you're competitive, you can get caught up in that. You always want the edge. You always want the what's going to take it to the next level. But if you're not careful, you can miss it. And I, that's one of the things that I love about this conversation, that you're competitive. That oh, you, yeah. you care about all the moving pieces but not to the extent of missing what truly matters, mm -hmm. whether that's with family, whether that's with faith, whether that's just with being on the water. Well, thank you so much for giving us some time. I love your story. It's incredibly helpful, filled with knowledge. If people want to learn more about you, want to learn more about your boats, where do they go? Um, well, I'm a pretty private person, but um, they can go to my website, Spear Boat Works, and they can they can learn a bit about me there. If they uh, want to buy a boat, they can contact me through my website, and uh, if I have the time, I'll build them one. Well, thank you so much for being on the, the podcast. It means a lot to me. I'm grateful for it, Harry. Thank you. You're welcome, Hunter. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to The Captain's Collective. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we ask that you take some time to share it with others. It really helps us as we try to get this thing off the ground. For more information about The Captain's Collective or to sign up for our newsletter, head to captainscollective.com. Thank you for listening. Till next time, may your lines be tight and the seas be calm.